all of you. And um, on behalf of Valley Community Presbyterian Church and the Mission Possible Committee, that is part of that uh, group and the Immigration Task Force, which is kind of the organizer of this program. Um, I want you to encourage you to um, have friends watch this at some later date because it will be posted on the website. And we will be having a book discussion on January 23rd at 11.30, led by Pat Daly. So people might, it's not necessary to uh, watch this before that book discussion, but it might just be interesting to, to know the background. Um, the format tonight is that Kalia will talk for approximately 45 minutes and then we will have time for question and answer after that, um, at least a good 15 minutes, but maybe a little bit longer. Um, Sheila already explained how you can access raising your hand during that period of time or right in the chat anytime during her talk. Uh, when the Immigration Task Force chose this book about seven months ago, we had really no idea that Valley Church would be assisting an Afghan refugee family in settling in the Twin Cities right now. Um, that event has made the timing of this book particularly timely and poignant as we are still learning that family's story. I want to introduce uh, Kao Kalia Yang, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that because she's better at telling her story than I am. But I do want to mention, if you haven't noticed on the, the back of her book, that she's the author of uh, The Song Poet, which received the 2017 Minnesota Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Ch Chautauqua Prize, the Pan USA Literary Award, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Her previous book, The Late Homecomer, also received the Minnesota Book Award as did her children's book, A Map Into the World. And she herself lives in St. Paul and would have been here in person under better circumstances. So, Kalia? Thank you, Janet, for that beautiful introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be with all of you tonight. I feel that there is no better way to commemorate today, the anniversary of what happened last year. I think this is exactly the kind of conversation that we need to be having. Um, like Janet says, I wish this could have been in person. But if we've learned anything, it is that Technology can be our friend. And technology has been so many of our friends in the last two years. And so I'm delighted to be able to come to you all today from my office, actually. I think the best way to start out uh, this evening is perhaps with a little bit of my own story before I talk about the work that I do with other people's stories. For those of you who know my work, and I'm curious how many of you have read my other books, show of hands. Okay, so some of you have. If you've read The Late Homecomer, you know that I became a writer because when I was a senior at Carleton College, my grandma took a fall. My grandma, whose paperwork said that she was 93 years old, but she had always said to me, may I am over 100. May I the, the Hmong word for little one, dear one. My grandma, who had promised me in Ban Binai refugee camp, the place where I was born, that she would never die because I cried and cried until she had no other recourse. Suicide was the number one cause of death in the place where I was born. All around me as a child, I heard the drums of the dead beating, mirroring the beating of the human heart. I heard cries of men and women, children. Why are you dying here? Why are you dying in this place that does not want you? Get up, get up so we can go home. Home was a place I couldn't envision. I was born in the refugee camp, 
that first wave of children to be born after the genocide of the Hmong in Laos for having helped the Americans in America's secret war. In that place where I was born, Hmong people were given food only three days a week. Thailand was practicing a humane deterrence policy. They didn't want more Hmong people flooding into their country for a war that they had not waged. And so I cried and my grandma, this, the oldest person I knew down to her last single tooth, she promised me that she would never die. One of her fondest dreams was my, was my education. My grandma who had never been to school, who did not know how to read or write, who all of my life with her signed her name with a shaky X that is stood in for Jolie. I was a senior that year at Carleton, the first person in my family to go away from for college, 45 minutes from St. Paul and for us, it could have been the world. My grandma who had dropped me off numerous times with my father, who said to me, I'm not gonna get out of this car until you graduate. When you graduate, you can hold my hand. You can walk me anywhere you want to. I was a senior. Already in my dreams, I started dreaming of a time when I would show my grandma Laird Hall, where all of the English, English classes were. I wanted to show her the bald spot, and more importantly, the trails that led away from it. Trails that had been paved over the tracks of deers and other wild animals, which I thought was so cool. But my grandma took a fall that winter break, and when I went to her and I told her to get up again, she looked at me and she said, May I? There were other people who loved me. There were people who loved me before you. Before you, I had a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, your grandpa, my most precious little girl. While there is no Hmong land in the map of a bigger world, I'm gonna climb this Hmong mountain inside my heart. I'm gonna swing open the door to the house of my youth. Dinner will be ready. Everybody will be there. You have to understand that there were people who loved me before you. My senior year, my grandma passes away February 18th, 2003. My heart is broken, but spring, but you can feel spring coming and everybody is excited about life after graduation. My grandma's favorite season is coming, the season where things grow forth from the earth, the season when the clouds carry the wind along gentle currents. I started writing my first book as a love letter to my grandma because when she died, I heard 13 suitcases because my grandma never had a room of her own. None of her children could afford houses that were big enough where grandma could have a room of her own. In her 13th suitcase, all she had were letters that my older sister and I had written her all of the years when we were apart. When she lived in California with my uncles and when we lived in Minnesota, before cell phone plans, there were long distance phone calls, but they cost money and we didn't have any money. And so my older sister and I, knowing that our grandma couldn't read or write, we would press really hard on the pages so that she could feel our words, that she would know that although the kids here in Minnesota didn't know that we had a grandma, we knew that we had her. My first book was that first love letter to my grandma. All of the things that I would never forget about her, the fact that she had been chased by a tiger in the jungles of Laos, and that one of her earring hoops had been trapped and broken open her earlobe. The fact that she was down to her last tooth, but she never said no to Jolly Ranchers or ice cubes. The fact that when I was a child and I used to make hundreds of wishes on the tall stars above, the high stars above, when they didn't come true and I despair, my grandma would tell me, you are doing it all wrong, Kalia. The stars are too high. You have to send your wishes on the plains. That means that they are somewhere in the world waiting to be found. Life will take you there. My grandma who gave me alternatives to everything, including the beauty that she saw in me, the courage that she recognized as her own. And so this love letter was getting very long because there was so much I wanted to talk to grandma about. I was on page 37 when my dad said to me, what are you doing? And I told him, I'm writing the last love letter to grandma. And my father said to me, words that changed the course of my life. He said, if you dream in the right direction, 
The dreamer never wakes. The dream never dies. It grows bigger and bigger, may I? And so a dream was born. What if I write a story about my grandmother's life? What if the world can miss her with me? What if in the pages of that book, I can be with her still, see her walk and hear her words, perhaps her laughter too. And so what emerges from me is a journey into this realm that nobody in my community had really ventured to before. I wanted to become a writer and I wanted to create my life with words. We Hmong people who have been denied a written language for so long across, across history, it was a new medium and it was a scary conversation. But when I told my mom and my dad, my mother looked at me and she said, I'm not surprised, you've always loved stories. My dad, whenever he worries, his thumbs move like this. And I could see that he was worried because they were moving. He looked at me and he said, if the sky that I live under can fall on me, if the earth that I walk on can throw me off, who am I to stand in your way? And so I went on a long journey, a journey that now is composed in nine different books for both adults and children. And before we get to somewhere in, in the unknown world, I want to read a children's book because I think that's today cannot end without a children's book, you know, a day like this. But I think this day, this book, my newest children's book, will also situate all of you in the perspective of this refugee child who becomes the writer before you today. And so we're going to do this old school. Um, I want you all to go to view and do speaker view. So when I'm holding up my book by my pictures, you can see them. Because my children's book career began in the pandemic. Um, my first one came out in 2019. This is my fifth children's book. I've not had much practice reading in front of students in person. And so I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to do what librarians do. So I'm going to like peek from the side, okay? But this is from The Tops of the Trees by Kao Kalia Yang, illustrations by Rachel Wada. And it's an international collaboration because Rachel Wada is based out of Canada. So she's Canadian. Um, now a children's book author, I don't know if you all know this, but you don't just get two separate covers immediately. This is my second um, different cover. So you have the outside cover and then you have the inside one and usually they're the same but I've now earned my stripes and so I get two different covers um, so this is the inside cover and these things are called end pages and we love end pages dedication for the loving arms that hold us high so we can see beyond the fences of our world and then this is Rachel's dedication, that was mine. To Galia, who has gone beyond the tops of the trees to share her story with the world. It is the first time that an illustrator has dedicated a, a book to me. From the tops of the trees. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way. Ban Vinai Refugee Camp, Thailand, 1985. When the sun gets to the highest point in the sky, the leaves of our favorite tree become a great umbrella of cool for my cousins and me to play under. Hurry! Mai throws a ball of rice onto the ground and so races the chickens in the yard to get to it. A bald rooster with black tail feathers beats her. The look on her face is so sad and so hungry, the fun disappears. I wave the lion dog and the Jackie Chan dog close. I hold onto the lion dog's neck and climb on his back. I push my little legs into his sides and try not to fall when he starts to walk. I can feel myself slipping off his back, but I'm not afraid. My father catches me just in time. In his arms, he lifts me higher and higher. I squeal. My father says, when someone falls, you have to pick them up and lift them higher than they were before. After a night of heavy rain and wind, we wake to find pebbly fruits scattered on the ground. 
Beneath our tree, Zoe and I crouch low and look for the fruits that are still good enough to eat. We know that if we eat too many, we'll get stomach aches and our mothers will be mad. If we eat only one or two, we can pretend we're eating hard candy and it is a very special treat. In the quiet, we hear the aunties talking about the war as they sow. They talk to each other about the river they had to cross to get to Thailand. They talk to each other about how Thailand wants Hmong refugees to leave their country. They're scared to return to the old country. They're scared to go to a new country. The adults talk of war and they get scared all over again as if the war was not yet over. That afternoon, I asked my father about the war, and he says, you're safe. He takes one of my small hands in his big one and tells me, look at your hand. He points down at the tips of my toes and says, look at your feet. He says, your hands and your feet will travel far to find peace. His eyes are as serious as his voice, so I say, yes, they will. It is rations day. Every week, a big truck comes into the empty space in the middle where we live. Thai soldiers give each family enough food for three days. They tell us they're practicing a humane deterrence policy so that no more Hmong people come into the country. I don't know what they're talking about, but I do what the adults around me do, and I nod my head like I understand. That evening before my bath, I looked down into the cement well and I asked my father why we live behind the gate. I want to know why other people can come in, but we can't leave. He says, we live in a refugee camp, a place to hold people who are running away from wars. I ask, father, is all of the world a refugee camp? No, he says. What is the world outside of this camp like? I ask my father has no answers for me. The next day, as my and Zoe and I play beneath our tree, my father walks to where my mother and auntie sit sewing. I hear him say, Jute, can you put Galia in her nice dress and her hat? My mother never allows me to wear them except for pictures. They lower their voices. Finally, my mother shakes her head, puts down her embroidery, and gets up. She waves her hand for me to follow. In our small room where we sleep on a bamboo platform bed on a folded blanket, my mother opens the suitcase where she keeps our nice clothes. She takes out the dress and the hat. She takes out my father's nice shirt and pants. Mother helps me take off my everyday t-shirt and shorts. She wipes me down with the shirt and then tells me to raise my hands over my head. I feel the cool fabric of the dress fall over my skin. I feel myself growing more and more beautiful with each button she closes at my back. Mother combs my hair before placing the hat on my head. She looks at me carefully, then shakes her head once again and smiles. Outside, my father is waiting with the camera he's borrowed. When we come out, he puts the camera in my mother's hands. I'll change quickly, he says. In our fine clothes, my father takes me to the tallest tree in the camp. He tells me to close my eyes and hold tight to his neck, to not let go no matter what. My Enzo stand at the base of the tree, staring at us, hands over their mouths. Even the aunties in the shade take their eyes off the work in their hands to see what we're doing. I tremble a little as I feel my father climb up the tall tree. I hold as tight to him as I can, tighter than I have even held the lion dog or the Jackie Chan dog. 
I can feel my heart beating in my eyelids. At one point, my father slips a little and my mother yells from underneath, but I don't let go and I don't open my eyes. It is not until my father says, look, the world is bigger than this place, that I open my eyes. I am higher than I have ever been. A breeze blows and the leaves shake and I shake with them. My father says, don't be afraid. And this is the first time I see a world beyond the fence where I was born. I see sky, I see birds flying high. I look down at my mother on the ground. She's run far from the base of the tree back to the bamboo patio on stilts. There she holds the camera toward us. I see Zao and Mai, the lion dog and the Jackie Chan dog look up at us too, their tails wagging. They are all small and far away. I look from the houses we live in to the cement wall toward the open field where we get rations then away from the camp itself, until I see the distant mountains rising at the place where the sky meets the earth. What is on the other side of those mountains? Another breeze blows, but I don't shake. Father, the world is so big, I say. My father answers, yes, it is. He says softly, one day, my little girl will journey far into the world, to the places her father has never been. My father tells me to smile at the camera, but I can't, because I now know that the world is bigger than anything I had imagined. My little legs will have to carry me far. And in the back of the book is the actual photo taken from that day. my father holding me up so that I might see a bigger world. Um, so you see, much of my work is nonfiction. It's based on my life, the lives around me. Every single thing I write is a love letter to someone somewhere who I believe needs my words. Little refugee children's waiting in refugee camps all over the world. These places that were, that were never meant to stand to the test of time. These places that are just holding centers. And so you see from that very first book, The Late Homecomer about my grandma's life, I've come a long way. I now write not just for the past, but for the future, future generations of Americans, citizens of a bigger world, young people who need to know that a great deal of diversity exists and that in that fabric of diversity, there is a role for each and every single one of us to play. I come from a place where our stories matter, where when all is said and done, they are our gifts to a bigger world. So in 2016, I had come out with two books and they were well received, critically acclaimed titles taught in universities across the land. From the moment I became a writer, I've been asked by different refugees from around the country, will you write my story? And my answer had always been no, because that story needs to come from your community. It needs to become, it needs to come from you. But in 2016, Donald J. Trump was elected president of the United States of America. I could hear the winds shifting around me. not your fears. In 2016, everywhere I looked, it was her words that I was hearing. I will build my life because of my faith, not because of my fears. And so I sought out to do something ambitious. I wanted to go into the community around me because Minnesota, while not high for diversity, has more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation. And I wanted to write the stories around me 
not everybody's stories because there are so many people, but I was going to talk to 15 people. It didn't matter what they were going to give me. I was going to write a story from each and every single one of them. That was the promise that I made to myself. As a member of a little known community, I'd seen so many times different scholars and authors and journalists come into the community, say, tell me your story. And when that story is told, I'd seen angles shifted, better subjects come along, nothing emerging out of those stories. And I didn't want to do that in this book. By this time, 2016, I, I was gaining, a, I've been teaching nonfiction writing, creative nonfiction writing for a long time. And so I'd studied craft, um, I was much further along than I was in the late homecomer. And so I thought that professionally, I was as ready as I could be. And so I went out into our community, yours and mine, and I talked to people, other refugees. The, the woman who worked at my children's pediatrician's office, the man whose children go to school with my kids um, at a St. Paul public school, just people around me. And that is what emerged in Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir, an oxymoron because how can a memoir be, be collective? The cry for peace has always been the same across the world, across eons of time. And so I knew that I was onto something. But what would emerge is Somewhere in the Unknown World, uh, a new work. I wasn't gonna hold a mirror so these refugees can see themselves more clearly. I positioned myself as an artist. I was gonna create a portrait of their lives so that they could see themselves filtered through the eyes of this writer, this artist, this refugee writer. And so that's what we sought out to do. I know that this is your book, group, book club title. And I know that perhaps some of you are done with the book already, but you've listened to the CD, we're at the concert. So I would be cheating you if I didn't do a little bit of a reading from this collection myself. So that's what we'll do. And you can all follow along if you have your books with you. Somewhere in the Unknown World, a Collective Refugee Memoir by Kao Kalia Yang. The book came out in right after Joe Biden was elected president. I don't believe in coincidences, but sometimes that's just the way life works. Dedication. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children, whose faith have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. The collection opens up with a poem by my favorite American poet, the great Lucille Clifton, quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some other wear alchemists mumble over pots, their chemistry stirs into science, their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman threading together her need and her needle nods to the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughters' daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? Um, I will read from, I will read from the beginning and the end. Uh, Irina's story uh, was particularly powerful for me because Irina is often um, not recognized as a refugee. You know, she's Jewish, she's from Russia. She's got incredibly, incredibly rich auburn hair and these incredible eyes a tiny woman, but huge voice. She's a singer across the Twin Cities. And when I sat down and talked to her, her story just moved me so intensely and I opened the collection with it. Part of the project of this book is also to complicate the refugee. We all have an idea of what the media wants us to believe of a refugee, but then there's this bigger reality. And so Irina's story was perfect for this. Um, I would read from the near the end of her collection. So page 14. Irina's aunt and uncle's villa was not far away and the families visited often. Occasionally, Irina made the trip by herself, feeling independent and safe. 
On the way, I read a past other villas with gardens, sometimes cultured, but other times overgrown, wild, in her opinion, more beautiful. On the path, there was an abandoned amusement park. Old cement garden gnomes stood like guards among unchecked vines that grew over the old rides, rusted metal roasting in the hot sun. There were even fountains full of green things growing where water once ran. The park was full of strange creatures made out of cement, metal, marble, and other materials that Irina did not know. Each time she passed the amusement park, the girl from Minsk understood what it would have been like to go on the rides, wondered what it would have been like to go on the rides. Even as the young woman she was becoming felt a wave of sadness and sorrow for the abandoned place, the things that are left behind. The family stayed in Italy for three months as spring turned to summer. Time moved slowly in that place of the sun, but that waiting period gave Irina time and space to remember and to forget what it had been like to be a girl and to encounter the beginnings of womanhood. Irina grew accustomed to a changing body, the swell of her breasts, the widening of her hips. In the spotless mirror of the fancy house, Irina saw that even her face had changed. Its previous roundness was disappearing and the bones of her mother's face were peeking through. Every evening, all the refugees congregated on the beach to talk about the news. Hundreds of Russian Jews met up on the smooth white sand in their fine clothes. They were all part of an exodus. The adults stood together and told the older children to watch over the younger ones so they would not wander too far into the sea. Each night, the family found that some of their friends had left, while new ones had come to fill their place. The wind in the ocean beckoned as the large gathering stood in uncertain freedom, tethered to shared histories and places far away. Among them, Irina stood fast, smelling like perfume, staring out toward the future. Every night on the beach, the group, the group found out who was going where, who got accepted and who got denied. There was always some family talking about how they'd been waiting for over a year to get processed many offered tips. It was a bad idea to say you were members of the Communist Party. It was not a good idea to say that your life had been easy, that you were an excellent student, or that you had been well respected at work. No one said anyone should lie, of course, but if you wanted to do well at the interviews, and each family usually went through two or three interviews before being accepted for resettlement, you had to say that you lived in the long shadow of Russian Jewish history, that your people had survived pogroms and that you were the remnants. The world knew what had happened to the Jews in Russia, but it did not know what would happen to the Jews now. Irina's family was part of that not knowing. And I will skip ahead because the best way for a writer to test her words is to read them aloud. And so now we move to Mayra's story. Up close, it is different. Mayra is from Bosnia. Um, Mayra is six feet tall. I'm barely five, so we're like a foot in difference. And the, but the day that I met Mayra, we had on the exact same shirt. It looked drastically different on us, but we weren't wearing the same shirt. And I thought, how strange. And then when I heard her story, it made perfect sense, this sameness that we were seeing on each other. And I'll begin from the very beginning of my story. Up close, it is different. Again, um, when many people look at Myra, they don't recognize that she is a refugee. Up close, it is different. I boarded the plane against the better judgment of my mother and father from Yala, the capital of the state of South Darfur in Southwest Sudan, not knowing what to expect. I was 23 years old at the time. I had just started working for the American Refugee Committee. I was not the team's first choice to go on the trip, but everyone else's visa had been denied. I was a recent college graduate and my resume was clean. Mine was the only visa approved. My task was to see what the 100,000 people in a refugee camp in South Darfur needed in terms of humanitarian relief. At ARC, we are interested in three primary areas of camp life, water management, health, and nutrition. My family had lived in a war zone. 
to return to one was the last thing that my parents had wanted for me. I found myself in the middle of the Sahara Desert, wind and sand and sun bearing down on me. I was thin and six feet tall, so immediately I stood out. A white girl with pale skin, brown eyes, hair pulled back in a ponytail. I saw the people looking at me with wild eyes, bodies tense. The little children who clung to their mothers in the doorways of the camp tents looked upon me with uncertainty. I was swept with a sense of nostalgia so powerful and familiar, I reeled from the unintended blow. An older man, the cultural leader in the camp, was the first to formally greet me. I held my notebook and pen in my hands and I bowed my head respectfully as he addressed me. He held his head high. His eyes were the color of brown glass. His wrinkled lids drooped over the tops of his eyes. His voice was deep and windy and old. He said, white girl, let me tell you. I listened quietly as he told me everything he wanted and needed. When he was done, I looked him in the eyes and said slowly, I too am Muslim. I, like the people in this camp, also come from a history of war and displacement. The old man listened to my words with grave interest. I could see a dawning understanding grow in his eyes. Then a smile emerged on his face, revealing a set of strong teeth that matched the set of his jaw. He said, yes. Why else would a white girl who was comfortable in one country choose to go to a new country to learn of the discomforts of other people? He added, I understand your empathy and your connections to this place now. Even though we look different, every refugee feels for another. We became friends. He became the cultural translator for me in the months I stayed in the camp to assess the needs of its most vulnerable families. I talked to the women who would not look me in the eye, who pulled their garments over exposed arms and legs and sat curled tight into themselves. I asked them things that the men in positions similar to mine had never asked. Why do you feel unsafe at the camp hospital? In that first trip and in all the trips that followed, I found in the different countries and people memories of my life in war-torn Bosnia. I found versions of myself, my mother, my father, and I got to ask them what they needed and, and to do the things that made their lives easier, better, and possible. In every trip I've taken, I've affirmed a promise I made to myself. I want to be the kind of person that I needed in our time of instability, in the worst years of the war. And my Mayra, again, um, I felt a tremendous connection to her because I think if my mother could have her, her way, I would write happy stories, people. I write fictional accounts of fairy tales, dragons underneath the water, castles in ruins, beautiful people with their hair blowing in the wind. But like Myra, I returned to the landscapes that have taught my mom and dad so much about loss and about grief. So that's a little from Myra's story. I'll, I'll end my segment of the reading with a piece from the end. And I think it has to be Afghanis because I know that your congregation is sponsoring a story from um, a, a family from Afghanistan. Certificate of Humanity. And I should tell you that Afghani reached out to me recently. His family was outside of the Kabul airport when the bombs went off. The moment Afghani left Afghanistan, his father was captured for many years and held for a ransom. He thought his father had died, but he was being held by the Taliban. When the, when the bombs fell off, went off outside of the airport in Kabul, the Taliban came to his home and they demanded where he was from his mom and dad. His dad, who was suffering from PTSD and so many other things. When they refused to tell where he was, his father was beaten in front of the whole family. And then in the weeks after the family, um, they hid and they were hungry. One day his mom went to the market, ventured to the market to buy vegetables. There the Taliban, they stoned her as the mother of an infidel. And so even as I'm here talking to you, Afghani is trying to 
trying to, to get his family out of, of a locked country. He's trying to apply for humanitarian parole. So the story is very present to me. Um, and I'll read from, I'll read from the leaving. Um, so this is the Certificate of Humanity and we will start from page 119 if you're following along. I made the decision to leave Afghanistan. I made arrangements with a human trafficker and was able to pay the price he demanded for taking me out of the country, $25,000 US. I tried to find a reputable trafficker, one who brought a contract for us to sign. The first line of the contract was a waiver. The trafficker was not responsible for my life or death. They had no responsibility to return my body alive or dead. Everything that happened to me on the road to probable survival depended on my following all of their instructions. Even then, they could not guarantee that I would make it out of Afghanistan. Other clauses in the contract said things like, they would divulge information only when it was necessary and the less I knew, the safer I would be. I signed the contract with a black pen. My mother and my father hovered behind me. The trafficker averted his gaze sympathetically. Somewhere of my home, a middle-aged man arrived at our house. He said, your son has 15 minutes before we go. He brought me a change of clothes, a pair of blue jeans, walking shoes, and a t-shirt. He said to take nothing. I changed out of my shawar as fast as I could. I wanted every last minute to be with my family. They all cried. It was not until we were in the car on our way to the airport that I could let my own tears fall. Outside the car window, I saw the broken walls of my city. I saw the war stricken poverty of my people. I felt our fear. And I'll skip ahead. Um, so they go on this tremendously long and arduous adventure, but ultimately they are gonna go to Sweden. And this is uh, on page 124. This is Afghani and a few fellow um, Afghanis trying to flee the country. The flight was short, only two hours. So this is the bottom of 124. The flight was short, only two hours. In that time, we decided in a frenzy of whispered conversations that it would be best if we destroyed all three of our passports. We would enter Sweden as refugees of war. We would slowly build lives in this place where none of us had ever been. How do three men each destroy three passports? What was our best option? We could think of only one plan. We had to take turns going to the bathroom during the flight. Each time we'd rip up two to three passport pages into tiny little pieces and flush them down the toilet. Our plan wasn't a great one. We took turns getting up, lining up, going to the bathroom again and again. People started giving us weird looks. No one else had an opportunity to use the bathroom. Even the flight attendants wondered whether we were all right. Yes, yes, we were all right. Still, we kept on lining up and flushing the toilet, and it was all getting very suspicious. When the captain announced that we were landing and told us all to go to our seats, one of my friends whispered that he had not managed to destroy his third passport, the Spanish one. We could only feel sorry. The plane landed and we entered an airport the size of a medium coffee shop. The flight crew and the other passengers were all wary of us. The airport staff sensed their wariness. They asked all the European passport holders to stand in one line. My friend, who had not managed to destroy his Spanish passport, went into that line. I and my other friend waited in a corner with no idea what to do next. When my friend's turn came to speak to the official, he was clearly nervous. Is this your passport? The official said. No, he said. The official looked at the picture of him and said, if this is not your passport, if this is not yours, is this your photo? I don't know who the passport belongs to, my friend answered. 
He was so nervous by now that he could not look at anyone. If this is not your passport, how did you get it? The official asked. The truth came spilling out in a jumble of a story that was filled with tears and stutters and regrets and the people he left behind in Afghanistan and the reasons why he had to leave and how he didn't know what would happen next. The official stopped him and calmly called over another official who had already contacted the police. Soon enough, the border police arrived and took him to a small room off the main terminal. Now all the passengers were looking at us in our corner. The suspicion on their face made us feel even more pressured and I had a bad feeling. The friend with me bowed his head and, walked and went over to another official. He said simply, I don't have a passport. I was now hiding behind a table crouching. I know they must have cameras. I know the airport is the size of a coffee shop. I'm 24 and I'm so scared that I'm hiding in view of everyone looking at me. A few of the border police come to take my friend away. Meanwhile, everyone is looking at me and I'm still hiding. Then I heard on the loudspeakers, the person hiding behind the table in the corner come out. They spoke in English and I understood every word. I had to come out. The officials surrounded me. They said a lot of things. I said nothing. They said more things. I'm not going to tell anyone anything I managed to say. That is just a little bit from Afghani's story. He is 30. Afghani is only 30. Um, he lives in these cities. He drives a Lyft driver. He's a Lyft driver by day. Um, his hair is all white. Afghani is 30. He has a head full of thick hair and it is all white because of everything that he's gone to, through. He's among the most incredible human beings I've ever met. Brilliant in every, every sense of the world. From the bigness of his heart and his understanding of humanity to, to the strength of his intellect. But these are just some of the people from somewhere in the unknown world, some of the individuals who live in these cities with all of us. And I should tell you all that as I was writing these stories, we were going through everything of the last, what, the four years of the Trump administration. And it was the reality that these people lived in these cities too that gave me the courage to get up every day because I, I knew we'd be okay. How could we not? When Mr. Michael and, 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 and all of these incredible people lived in these cities with us, with everything that they are, with everything that has made Minnesota home to more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation. And so at this time, it's 7.50, and I want to invite your questions. Um, Sheila will facilitate the Q&A if you have any questions and you want to put it in the chat or the raise hand function if you, if you prefer that. This is a small group, so please. And as the moderator, I taking the prerogative of the first question. You've already referenced the, that this is the anniversary of the uh, very violent insurrection from last year. And without raising any political things, I wondered if um, how refugees are feeling about our country. Are they feeling our country is a safe place to come? Are they worried? Do you have any feelings about that? So, so I think some, some facts are important. America is the biggest refugee resettlement country in the world. You know, so what we choose to do in terms of refugee resettlement has a lot to do with how the rest of the world, uh, how, how, how the refugees of the world, um, their likelihood of resettlement period. We now know that there are refugee camps that have lasted, you know, the span of 30, 40, 50 years because there's no country, there are no countries waiting to receive them all. When the Trump uh, presidency began, you know, refugees in America were very much divorced politically. And so there was a big hold on refugee resettlement. Here in Minnesota, we have five agencies. One of those agencies closed down simply because there was no funding. 
and there was no ability to actually resettle fe refugees with the administration we had in power. And so now we have like four active re refugee resettlement agencies in this in the state. So beyond refugees themselves, um, the, the people who are invested in this international movement, they were all suspended effectively for four years. And I think that is really important for, for all of us to understand. Within the refugee context, and here I speak for myself, I came when I was six. I began first grade here in America. My first language, written language was in English. A, B, and C were my first three letters. When I was in, when I was in college, uh, there was an incident that happened at Carleton. Now Carleton is in Northfield. A lot of us know this. And in Northfield, there are two colleges, not just one. There's St. Olive and there's Carleton. A lot of people get lost in the between. And so one day, because I thought I was pretty witty, at Carleton, the, the philosophy is that the health of the body is reflected in the health of the mind. And so we all had to take PE requirements. I'm not very physical. And so I decided to take a, a meditation class in downtown Northfield and get credit. It was a very lovely experience for the most part. But one day as I was coming up from meditation class, climbing the hill back to Carleton, on my way back to the dormitory, a maroon car stopped in front of me. Instead of walking away, I thought the people were lost. Their windows went down, so I walked toward them, thinking I could help point them in the right direction. McDonald's came flying out at me. Ice cube, soda, ketchup. There were two men in the car and they called me all sorts of names of things I had never been. And they said for me to go home, to go where I came from. Walked back up the hill, went to the dorm. My heart was broken in a way it had never been before. You know, I grew up studying about Martin Luther King Jr., Mahama Gandhi, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, all of these incredible people who believed that there was a future in peacefulness, who believed that we could have a dream and that the dreams could grow bigger than ourselves and that it could invite others in and that we could envision a more beautiful world. But that day, None of that mattered. It was after that trip that I decided um, to, to leave America the very first time in my life. I said I was going to go back to Thailand, to the place where I was born. I was going to go find the refugee camp where I was born. I was going to walk among the ghosts and figure everything out after. On that trip to Thailand, I had to become an American. I couldn't go as a you know, as a permanent US permanent residential alien, I needed a passport so I could stand in line with the other American students. And so I took the citizenship test and that was the first experience of me being American. I got to Thailand and everybody looked at me and they would guess where I was from. And everybody guessed every single country in Asia. I have a face that belongs in China, belongs in Japan, belongs in Korea, every, everybody. And whenever I said I was Hmong, they would say, you don't look like Hmong from the hills. Then they would take a closer look at me and they would look at the way I was eating and the way I was walking. And they'd say, wait, you're an American. The very first time I was called an American was by international people in Thailand because they said, you're too sloppy to come from Asia. The way you eat, the way you walk, your movements, you are an American. I went to the place where I was born. I saw nothing I recognized. The river of my youth was nothing more than a sewage canal. Even the grave mounds buried on the hillsides, they had been dug out by a Chinese corporation to use Hmong bones as medicine. There was nothing left there for me. The wind and the rain had done its work. And so I came back understanding that sometimes who we are exists only because we do. And that our memories, even the physical places in the world, sometimes they're no longer there to be found. I came back with the stubborn fire burning inside of me to realize whatever an American meant and to live in that dream of Martin Luther King Jr. But Along with all of that, then I had to owe up to the incredible history of this place, a history, you know, with native, the native peoples, a history with the African American slave trade. It was a big history and I had to carry all of that as well. When January 6th happened, Janet, I felt very much like an American. 
like the heart of American democracy had been ripped open right before my very eyes. But before that, I was a mother, Janet. It happened during virtual school. And so my kids were there with me watching on CNN and my nieces, my nephews, and they said, what is going on? Why are all of those people carrying the American flag and why are things breaking? And I had to build a, a, a narrative for them, a narrative of change, positive change. I looked into their eyes and I said, after this, we will, we will pick up those pieces. We will, we will make whole again what is broken and we'll become a better place for all of you. And I said, and who's to say that any one of you, that, that one day these Hmong American kids, my children, interracial, gray green eyes and curly hair, that one day one of you could be right there among those people, not the people breaking in, but the people holding strong, the tenets of American democracy. That's how I felt as a mother, as a child refugee, as a writer of refugee stories and a keeper of refugee stories. A desire, a desire to preserve the beauty of this place so that it can remain what it has always been, a beacon for refugees from around the world. Whatever we are, that is what America has been to refugees around the world. A beacon not because America is perfect, but because America grants an opportunity, an opportunity for our stories to continue. You see, the refugee faces death. There is no life in waiting. Did I respond to your question, Janet? Are there any hands raised, Sheila? No, I don't see any raised at this moment, and there's nothing in the chat at this time. Well, I are you all, all going to make this easy for me? You have to prepare me. I'm giving con the Carlton Convocation next Friday on this book. So <laughs> well, I had um, another, I'm not sure it's a question, but as I read your book, I felt like you were, um, you were walking with these people, feeling what they felt, seeing what they saw, and but that's impossible. I mean, you were you haven't been there. I how did you do that? I think how maybe do the best do way. How the best way to to perhaps begin to to, to wrap myself around your thoughts here. Um, only in the hopes that my thoughts, the process may be useful, is this perhaps through the example of Mr. Michael. So Mr. Michael's daughters had gone to college with me. And um, Helen says, my father is such a great storyteller, you should meet him. And so Mr. Michael and I met at a Starbucks on the edges of the University of Minnesota. It was packed full of students. And Mr. Michael said to me, there are pictures that I've carried inside my heart. I've never developed them for a bigger world. I never had a camera to take them. But if you want, if you sit here, I would develop them for you. And maybe you can develop them for a bigger world. When Mr. Michael started talking, and I, I, I asked, you know, very open-ended question. You know, if we were to talk about your life, where, where's the beginning? And Mr. Michael took me to, 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 to the plains of his beloved, you know, Eritrea. He took me to his grandma, who he thought was his mom. And he started crying and I started crying. We used up every available napkin in that Starbucks. <laughs> Mr. Michael and I, part of the work of being a writer like me is you cannot tell people to stop because it hurts. You have to be able and willing to go through that hurting with them. You cannot say things are better because they're not. You have to be where, you have to be where the story is. And so it is this very emotional journey. After Mr. Michael was done, this is two and a half hours later, you know, we have this mountain of Kleenex between us. And he said, now you have the film. Now you will develop these photos. It took me a year, Janet. I came back and I just wrote out everything that Mr. Michael, that I had heard from Mr. Michael. And I, I sent them back to, to him and I said, did I get it right? I didn't say, do you like it? I just asked, did I hear you right? Is it accurate? And I did this with every single um, story. And when they came back and they said, yes, 
that's when I let it seep deep into who I am and then to pull it, revive it again, to pull it again. And I think that is like the an artistic transformation that happens. Because in the beginning, I can only work with what they give me. And then there comes a point at which the stories are now buried so deep in the fabric of who I am, then when it emerges, it comes out in an entirely different way. And that was the gift of each and every single one story. You know, call story, leaving with no goodbyes. Oh, that brave man. So our children go to the same school. We met at like a multicultural evening. And when we met two, two blocks away from the children's school at a coffee shop, and Carl starts telling me the story, he looks at me and he says, it doesn't matter if the world judges me, I've judged myself already. And there is the bravest human being I've ever met. And so he tells me his story and I write it out. The day before the book came out, I made sure that every single one of them got a copy. I can tell you, Janet, I was very, very nervous, you know, waiting for my phone to ring, waiting for the text to start coming in, for the emails to start, to, to start coming. But when they did, it was full of tears. Tears of gratitude. The stories that I've written, I wanted to be a gift for each and every single individual. And then I wanted it to be able to go to work in their lives for the people they loved most before the work of a bigger community. And that was exactly what happened. You know, like Afghani writes me because there are things happening in his life. Because to, 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 to apply for humani humanitarian parole, you need a pretty good story. And Afghani recognized that I was a pretty good storyteller. And so it's real relationships that we're talking about and real individuals in these communities. I didn't look far. I didn't, I didn't need to. Do you know whether um, these stories had been shared with their families before or was this in some cases a first uh, release? I know like in the case of veterans, for instance, uh, have gone through so much trauma that they don't really want to talk about it to their families. So I was just wondering if, if that was true for these um, refugees. So many of the children who've read these books have written me and they say, this is the first time, or I never saw it the way you did, the way he must have felt. And that's, I think, something that I've learned you know, when I wrote The Late Homecomer, I wrote it about my grandma. My grandma had nine children. Those nine children have lots of children. You know, and everybody thought we came from the same story and everybody thought we knew the same woman and we lived the same life. But then they read the book and they said, there was so much I didn't know, you know? Or in the case of my uh, nieces and nephews, they're like, when, you, when your parent tries to tell you something, it's not that interesting. When it is presented in school, and this is the first time in your whole educational journey that you're meeting a story about Hmong people, that's a different game entirely, you know? And I, I should say, Janet, um, I have a brother who's, uh, who just turned 18. He's applying to colleges right now, or he's just submitted applications. Um, but the song poet was taught at his school and Maxwell, I wrote the teacher when I saw it on the syllabus and I said, oh, Max is in your class and this is our story. You know, um, Maxwell sat through the lessons. He sat in class, you know, he listened, he didn't contribute, he chose not to, but he listened because he wanted to see the ways in which people were gonna meet him after having read the story. It's, it's an incredible thing to be a writer. These books are like babies and they're in inside of me and then they're in my arms for a long time and then they like this one it's a pandemic book so it's still learning how to walk it's a little bit slower than all the other books right for adults it's learning how to walk but soon it moves further and further away from me and then I get to see it run sometimes the song for a poet for example will premiere as a main stage production by the Minnesota Opera in the fall of 2023 it's gonna it's been turned into an opera and will be performed in songs an incredible journey that neither me nor my subject, my father could have envisioned. These books, art, art is art because it has its own life, a life beyond, beyond the creator. 
you know, us as creators. Um, and, and I think the creator up there and everywhere as well, each of us, there's this idea of free will, you know, and there's this, this very real, I think, belief in miracle. And so, and so the miracle of the book surprises even me. I want to say that, you know, I knew what I was doing with each story and then I didn't know how the book would come together. And then I didn't know how the book was going to be received. There's so much unknown. And that's the beauty of this, right? Mm -hmm. If everything was known, it wouldn't be that great. For example, we all know that we're going to die one day. It's not a, it, that's not the mystery in life. The mystery is what we get to do and what we get to feel before then. That's what we're all doing. We're poking our heads around the corner, you know, chasing the shining lights, holding hands that are still warm to the touch. That's the beauty of the experience. Mm -hmm. Leah. I want to, Richard, actually, well, Richard, we have a question. I would like to, oh, okay. so, nope, nope, not right now, not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Pat Daly would actually like to know, uh, what are you working on next? What's your next book? I am on March 31st. I have to submit a manuscript for my next big memoir. It's called Return of the Refugee, and it is my mother's story. It is the first time that I write her story. It's a story that I've been waiting to write for at least 10 years, but I needed to wait until I was a mother before I could do it. I needed to wait until we could return to the burial place of her mother before I could do it. You know, my mother left her mother when she was 16 to marry my father, to walk toward this life with us. Because of the war, she never got to see her again. And you growing up, my mom always said to us, you know, whenever I get to where my mother is, I'm going to tell her everything. I'm going to tell her that the love that she gave me in those first 16 years, that it grew and it multiplied inside of me, and it was enough for a whole lifetime without her. And I thought, perhaps foolishly, that when, when we returned to Laos, that my mother would have so much to tell her mother, even the spirit of. But the moment we went back, the moment my mother saw the burial mound, the moment my mother put her hand to that little spiritual door, there were no words, Pat. There were only her cries, the cries of a little girl, the cries of a 16-year-old being pulled from her mother, the cries that I've never heard in my life before. And so I'm writing this saga of, of this woman's life. It will come from Atria Books, um, perhaps in 2024, because that's the nature of the industry and COVID has slowed everything down. So that's the next project that's due from me. In 2022, so last year I came up with five books. Last year was an incredible publishing year. 2022, I get to rest. 2023, we're gonna hit the ground running with at least three new books out from me. So lots of things coming out from Kalia Yang. Including Atria. Yeah, Atria. Yes, I've done the libretto. And so the Minnesota <laughs> Opera, the team is coming together beautifully to, to pull this thing off. Well, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm Richard Bull. I'm the pastor at, at Valley Church. And I'm just um, so moved by your stories. Um, this whole book, the, the, the Somewhere in the Unknown World, I mean, each, each chapter could be a neighbor, could be somebody, you know, in the community. And, um, and you have just put those out there so clearly for us to, to understand. And, um, and now with our Afghan uh, family, it's even more, uh, more precious um, for all of us, you know, white, you know, Caucasian Minnesotans um, who are just trying to do our best to um, wrap our arms around uh, as many people as we can. And, and, and you're, you are just a shining example. And I'd love for you to come and fill the pulpit some Sunday. <laughs> if you well, do thank well, you so much. If you do well with the convocation, maybe you can uh, bring that convocation speech to the church. <laughs> that would be lovely. I, I think Carlton records them, so we'll see. It's next Friday at 10.50, just like when I was a student. Yeah. You know, we, we leave, but the places stay, and they hold true these things. 
Yeah. As, as you all, I want to thank you tonight for holding true my words and these stories mm -hmm. and for the work that you do. You know, people have come, Minnesota is what it is because of religious organizations opening up, you know, ideas of Christianity, understanding mm -hmm. that Jesus himself was a refugee and that we belong only because we belong to each other. So thank you all for, for Zooming again. I know it's been a long Zoom world, so thank you. Thank you. Everybody clap. Everybody clap. <laughs> thank you, Kalia. Thank, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so be much. Be well. We will, we will be with your book uh, on January 23rd. We have a book discussion going on at the Church uh, of the Unknown Unknown World, so we will look, look forward to all of us diving into it further. So thanks for setting the groundwork. Thank you. Great, great. Good night. <laughs>